Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Am I loud enough? Yes. Sounds good. Okay. Because because I don't want to speak too softly, but I don't want to sound like I'm yelling at you because I'm really not yelling at you. Um, so thank you very much for letting me do this. Uh, I'm really glad we get to do this. And I want to thank uh, Nado Shihan for you know allowing us to do this. And uh, Lauren and Ken and Bob and, and uh, Richard and whoever else has been involved in this is lovely. I didn't realize how much work went into it until I tried to figure out how to make a space that was suitable for Zoom because it's a lot harder than it looks. And I should have had a lighting guy and a makeup guy and stuff, but I didn't. So it, it was harder than I thought. So what I wanted to do today was, uh, first of all, why don't we bow into a sensei it's over here. Um, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about uh, how long uh, we've all been training and, and the different influences that come into us. And so uh, last week I had to write uh, like my little Aikido biography for the CAA website. And it was funny what it triggered. It triggered a lot of memories of like people you wouldn't necessarily think about. Like normally I would think, well, I trained with Nado Sensei and I have done that for many, many years, but there's other people on the path. And it's hard to say who has all these influences on you until you really sit down and think, well, you know, what are these influences? So the influence that led to today uh, is a guy named Peter Ting. So Peter was a teacher at uh, City Aikido. He was a lot older. Uh, than we were. He uh, was raised in China. His father was a Northern Prime man, Fifu, who trained him vociferously in martial arts so that he was so good at martial arts, he became uh, General George Patton's personal bodyguard during World War II. And he told me that it, in doing that, he quite often would have, the spies would try to get into the tent. He would, he would basically kill them. Um, so he was a trained martial arts assassin, and then he went somehow and saw uh, Aikido, and he saw a sensei, and everything changed for him. So by the time I met him, he was a lovely, sweet, he was just a lovely man. And he left, he had all these books, and he gave them, he gave some of his books to me. And one of the books he gave to me was a book from 1968 by Tohei called This is Aikido. Um, now, of course, you know, and here's the picture with the man flying in the air. And, you know, to Tohei, at the time I started training, Tohei ran the Key Society, which was sort of, you know, we were Humble Dojo and they were the Key Society. But, they all came through a sensei. And so in reading this book, I, I actually enjoyed uh, this book a lot. And at the beginning of it, he's got these things called undu. And uh, I asked Lauren earlier today how you pronounce that, because I'm not very good at Japanese pronunciations. And I said, what does it mean? And he said, well, it means movement. Um, but they teach school children to do undu which are calisthenics. So these are key undo that uh, Tohei put in his book and that I actually started practicing and I found them quite useful. So uh, I've made a list of 13 of them, which I'll try to get through. Uh, I think hopefully you'll do these with me because if you don't, it's gonna be a pretty boring class. So I'd suggest that we do these together. I find them very useful. Um, if I say go to neutral stance, neutral stance is just, uh, you know, you're relaxed, relax your head, relax your shoulders, drop your concentration into your one point, and generally try to feel that the bottom side of your uh, appendages are heavier than the top side. Okay, so I, I Hope you'll do these with me. I think they're lovely exercises. And I, I think Tohei meant them. Uh, he basically said these are to help you unify your spirit with the divine. So good motivation. 
So the first one we're going to, so remember the four things we're working on is relax your head, which means your brain, which means your little eye that Nadeau talks about. Relax your shoulders, drop your center of attention into your one point, which is below your navel, and make the <clears throat> bottom, side of your, bottom sides of your uh, extremities heavier than the top side. The first one is called Nikyo Undo. Now you all know what Nikyo is, but we're gonna do it in a slightly different way. So normally before class people do this and it's you know kind of loosen your wrists and you're not really thinking about it. Well, today we're gonna to do it as, an un, uh, as a one point undo, which means when we do this, we're gonna follow the precepts of relax your head, relax your shoulders into your one point, and when we do this, we're gonna send energy from the one point out through the system equally through both hands. Again. More. Other side. So then back to neutral stance. And again, the same four things are working. We're relaxing our brain, relaxing our shoulders, energy to your one point, and make the bottom sides of things heavier than the top side. So the second exercise is Kotagaishi undo. I know you all know Kotagaishi, but again, we're gonna follow the same principles. We're gonna do Kotagaishi from our one point, and we're gonna send energy in equal amounts out through both of our hands. Again. Again. To the other side. Again. One. Back to neutral. Okay, the third one is called, and I, if I'm doing the pronunciation wrong after class, ask Lauren how to do this. I don't, I'm not good at pronunciation. This one's called Takubi Furi Undu, and this is basically a chance to shake, okay? What you're gonna do is you're gonna shake your wrist, not everything, your wrist, because remember, we're keeping calm, relaxed, one point. You're gonna shake these and see if you can shake, your, if, if you can feel the shaking in the one point. Relax again. Again, shake. Relax again. Shake again. Ah. Okay. 
The next one is going to be the rowing exercise. Now, we've seen different versions of this over the last couple of weeks. Last week, Lauren did one with vocalizations. Uh, the first week, Tija Bell did one, uh, which had a slightly different em emphasis. Here, we're working on moving the one point. So remember, calm your mind, relax your shoulders, energy to the one point. We're going to do the rowing exercise to move the one point forward and backward. So if you want to make vocalizations, go for it. Just make sure you're on mute, okay? So I'm moving this from the one. Central. And do the other side. And back to neutral. So now we're going to do one that's called Minucci Ikkyo Undo. So this, I'm going to move back a little further. So this is basically, you're going to, it's kind of like a rolling exercise, except you're going to be moving your hands up. And you can, if, if you want to like hook your breathing into it, a lot of times when I do this exercise, I breathe in and out. But I think when Tohei trained it, it was more about sending energy from the center through the system. So, and again, if you want to vocalize, go for it. And remember your concentration is in your one point. And you should feel like these other events are coming from the one point. Back to center, other side. And then that same next, so make sure you're staying, keeping with our principles. Relax your head, shoulders relax, energy to one point, heavier on the bottom of the limbs. So that same exercise, if you do it uh, in two directions, is called Zengo Undo. And so in this case, you're just going to go here. And I'm sure you're all familiar with an eight-sided exercise. So I'm going to move back so you can see my feet. And if you can't hear me, just tell me and I'll speak louder. Okay. So we're going to do an eight-sided version of this. And this is called Papo Undo. 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step forward with my left foot and do the first version. Turn 180 degrees, second. Turn 90 degrees, turn 180 degrees, turn 45 degrees, 180 degrees, 90 degrees, and 180. And that should complete eight sides. So let's do it again. I'm just gonna count one through eight. And remember you're doing this, empty your mind, relax your shoulders, center to one point, heavier on the bottom, okay? So let's see what it's like. So one, two, three, four, five, six, Front. Do it again. So one, two, four, five, six. Back to neutral. And last time, one, two. So the next undo is so we're all this is what we usually call just the blank. And of course there's different ways to do this. I'm just gonna do the way that totally showed him, which is basically here. Here. I'm trying to turn from my center from the one point. So the next one is called Takubi Kosa Undoing. I actually like this one a lot um, just because I think it's a really nice one for loosening up your key and expanding it. What we're going to do is we're going to breathe in out back to the one point. In, Back to neutral. We'll do that one again. In one point.
that natural. Okay. The next one is Sayu Andu. When I when I think hear the word Sayu, I always think of Nick's gardens because Nick taught me the name Sayu, Sayu Nagi. And I had before it always thought of it as a kokinagi, but he said, no, it's Sayu Nagi. So the exercise for this is basically a little circle from the center. Little circle from the center. There's a little bit of a drop of the hands at the end too, I find out. And if you want to get fancier with this one, uh, Sugano Sensei in New York taught it a slightly different way. He would start in neutral. And then he would do a cross step and put one hand in front of the center and then do the side. So here, cross step. So you've got one hand, one point, one hand out. So this hand's palm up, palm down, step across, sign that way. Out, cross, oops. Out, cross, so dancers like this one, because it's a little bit of a, <laughs> cross step, energy at the center. Back to neutral. So then from your one point, this is all, I mean, you're all familiar from doing this at the beginning of class, it's basically just move, but you're moving from the one point, not from the shoulders. And if you want to add more motion to this, it will become Ude Furi Ando, which we all know as two step. So uh, the last two are Ushiro undus. Let me see what time it is. This is good. Timing is good. I was afraid, actually, I was afraid I was going to end early and then go, oh, what do I do? So this is good. The first one is called Ushiro Tori undu, and it's basically a movement as if you had someone grabbing you from behind and you were throwing them across your shoulder line.
This can also be done as more of a classical irminage undo, which is just without so much of a feeling of cutting, cutting across the shoulder. This one I do like to do with the breath, breathing in and out. Because it's a koki, it's a breath extension. So I saved the hardest one for last. Actually, I, at least I think it's the hardest one. So this is, it's called Ushiro Takubi Tori Zenshin Undu. And again, ask Lauren how to pronounce these. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my front foot forward and put my hands uh, with the palms, with the hands facing up. I'm gonna bring that above my head, turn the hand, and drop down into a crouch position. Back up. Here. Here. Back. Try the other side. This is nice. It's a little like telemark skiing. How am I doing for time, Lord? You have three minutes. Okay. So I think I'm good in terms of what I wanted to show today. These, uh, so the reason I like doing these is, um, you know, when I was in college, I studied some works by a guy named Carl Jaspers, who was a Christian existentialist. And, it, and he wrote, wrote a book called Reason and Existence. And in it, he was, his goal was to approach union with God. And he said, it's like a impenetrable circle. And your job is to get inside that circle. And you don't know which way is going to lead in. You, you, you'll learn different ways. You'll learn paths, techniques, many, many ways. But he said, you approach the truth you're seeking. And sooner or later, one of the things you do will help you find the connection to whatever source of inf infinite energy you're looking for. And I think Aikido is a little like that. Um, you know, I'm, I've been very lucky to study with Nado for 40 years, but I've also been lucky to meet many other people as well. And I tried from each person to find things that help, you know, try to crack the code of, of, the, of the connection of union to, to infinite energy. And so I think these undo, you know, they may work for you, they may not. But what, you, what they are is they're tools. And we've, we're all given tools. We're given tools by Nado Shihan. We're given tools by the many people we train and train with and train under. And they're all tools that we can use to try to, as uh, Tija said, we were polishing the stone. Well, we are polishing. We're, we are our own stones that we polish. And if the more techniques you have at your disposal, the more things you have that you can use in your quest to become sort of the most infinite version of yourself that you can. So if these are helpful to you, uh, I hope they help you as one of the tools on your tool bed. Thank you so much, Ross. And would you like to take questions or would you like to bow out? Good either way. Uh, does anybody want to ask Roy a particular question? He'll be back at the end as well, all three instructors. Okay, why don't we just do it at the end? That's fine. All right. And so if you'd like to close out your class, then uh, if you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much.
All right. And so uh, we're going to go on a five minute break. And uh, when you hear this bell again, it's time to come back. And up next in a few seconds is uh, Roy Johnston. 
Uh, Six Don, also a longtime instructor at City Aikido of San Francisco, and uh, proud to say a fellow New Jerseyan. So uh, happy to introduce Roy Johnston. Take it away, Roy. Uh, thank you, Lauren. I uh, just want to take a moment just to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I really appreciate you participating in this and uh, everyone's commitment to Aikido and the process. I uh, certainly want to thank Nado Sensei for uh, all of the years that he's been teaching me. Uh, and uh, also want to thank the tech team, Lauren Hare, uh, Richard Moon, and Kenneth Cron for putting this whole thing together. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's bow in, we'll bow in over here. And on Agashimasu. Okay, first thing I thought we'd do is uh, I want to connect up to our center line. So the way I'm going to do this or suggest we do this right now is to just get in a, a stance in which uh, we keep our heels together, our uh, feet facing out, maybe 45 degrees, our toes facing out, a good lineup of structure to our center so that we are we're highlighting the center that's here completely straight as best we can, not overly done, just present, relaxed, kind of like as Ross brought us through initially. And then we're just gonna raise our hands up here, very lightly, nothing heavy, I'm not holding it, just a gentle hold here, just a gentle opening, allow the center to appear, show itself, and then just gradually allow yourself to just rotate ever so slightly. So the idea here is not to do a twist, but to just simply let the center line show itself as it is. So the center is there, we're just allowing it to be there and bring it into a little bit clearer focus for ourselves, kinesthetically. Okay, we can move maybe a little more, whatever you're comfortable with here. Just allow that center line to be the focus of your attention and experience. Okay, now we're gonna keep our legs out a bit, maybe in a, like a, a sumo stance, uh, maybe one and a half width of our shoulders here. And we're just gonna get a sense of the ground underneath us. Okay, so there's a, there's a flooring that we're on or a ground or a land, whatever you want to, term that and however you want to hold that at the moment, but there's something we're standing on. There's a, there's a connection we have to the ground underneath us. And if you need to move your toes and make that connection even more, just so you get that feel. And I'm looking at this from the perspective, almost as if you had your hands together and you kind of sealed them so that there's no air in between the palm of one hand and the palm of the other we're getting that same kind of experience or exploration with our feet on the ground. So again, keeping that connection to our ground. And as we do that, we don't wanna lose that center we just developed. We just twisted in a center, we've got the center here, and now we've just added a ground, a connection to the ground, all right? And from that connection to the ground, there's our legs. So we have the legs that are connected there to the feet, to the soles of the feet, to the ground. And we're gonna allow that structure to just support us. So we're gonna get a base of support under us, a foundation of support that we're gonna tap into and allow ourselves to experience here, okay? So we've got the center line, we have a base of support, a connection to the ground, and now we're just gonna pivot a bit. So we've got our legs in operation, we're pivoting here, and so now the hips are pointing in one direction fully along with our direction of our, uh, of, of our presentation here. And then we'll just switch to the other side. So again, we're not holding our hips back like we would be doing a reverse karate punch or something. We're bringing them into the picture. So we have a nice alignment here looking to the right or left, depending upon which way you're doing it. And then we go in the other direction again. So again, we're squared away, 
We have a base of support under us, a good structure, and we've got that center line here. Okay, back. And four. And coming back to the center, we're going to recognize that there's a there's a physicality up top. So in, in addition to having the structure underneath us, we have a a presence, a torso, a hara, a, a structure here. And from there, all we're going to do is we're going to allow that structure to come out through our arms. So the structure supports the movement of the arms. The foundation supports the movement of the arms, and there's an outward expression. So it's bringing our chest into play here and out. In. And we'll go in the opposite direction. In. Out. In. Again, maintaining that center line, keeping our sense of base underneath us. So a line, center, base. Up. Okay? And from there, what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit to the left. So here, just going to go to the left. Left side. And right side. Left side. And right side. And so there's a nice extension again that's coming through the system from the base of support and foundation that we've established. Left, right, right, left. Okay, we're going to pick up the shoulders a bit so we get the whole body into play, whatever hasn't been, bringing it to life, kind of activating the whole system here. And around, rotating one way, rotating the other, bringing it all into play. Bringing the hands, keeping the hands alive. So we've got the arms and the hands, opening the fingers and the wrists. We'll connect up the wrists here and just let the wrists roll. In the opposite direction. And down. Okay. What we'll do is we're going to pick up, we're going to recognize here that there's a, a base of support under us, and we're just going to bring that up. So there's an energy base, an energy pull down here. We're going to let that come right up through the system and down again. Up through the system and down again. Okay. We're going to use that structure, that foundation we have, the center line up. And down again. Up. And down again. Okay. All right. So what I want to suggest here is that what we've just done to a certain extent is we've kind of set up a, uh, a way to calibrate or to uh, connect up to our physicality such that wherever we came into this picture or any situation, we're at a kind of a different level from here, right? I mean, if we've brought our whole body into the picture, into the play, into the action, into the situation, then we're something more than what we walked in with. Because when we walk into any situation, we're walking in with a somewhat of a membrane, right? We've got a certain context about us, and that context is the situation to a degree, but it's also who we are that we are. It's our identity, it's our uh, you know, who we know, it's what we've done, it's uh, our family, it's where we live, the neighborhood, the city, the state, and we can identify with all of that, but I'm suggesting that that whole thing is somewhat of a membrane that we live in, and that this process can take us to a place in which we kind of step beyond that initial membrane of ideas of who we are and move into a more physicality actual as Nado Sensei would say, in terms of bringing ourselves into current uh, presence so that we're here at another level of operating. Okay, so it all depends upon how we hold this and how we hold ourselves 
in terms of how large this membrane is. So I'm gonna suggest in this class that to a certain extent, our membrane is kind of captured uh, in a very somewhat limited way. And the way that it's captured is really how we are, are identifying ourselves. And so I'm gonna suggest that what we can do is we can look at this from a perspective of being on uh, a larger domain, which I'm gonna suggest is the earth. So I think oftentimes we don't necessarily think of ourselves as living on a planet, right? We think of ourselves and we identify ourselves in all sorts of ways, but not in a way of we're actually on a planet. And so, I'm going to show you a sequence in a few, a few minutes that I use to kind of go into another dimension. And before I do that, I want to tell you a story about that. So for, I guess this was about a year and a half ago, I was uh, working this, with this process that Nado Sensei has been teaching us. And I was inquiring for myself as to really what was next, what was up for me, what was the next uh, level for me. And so I went out on the beach here in San Francisco on the, uh, on the bluffs out here. And uh, so it overlooks the Pacific Ocean, kind of mountains on the side, uh, sand beach in front of me, uh, Pacific Ocean in front, and it was the sun setting that day. So I'm out there, it was a very windy day. And uh, so I started to do this process. And as I was doing that, I became very acutely aware of the elements that were there. You know, the sun, the fireball in the sky, the earth that I was standing on, the uh, wind that was blowing, it was a very windy day, uh, the water that was in front of me. And I was also very conscious of this process that I was exploring, which is, you know, to some degree somewhat mysterious, moving to other dimensions, right? And yet it's accessible to us. And so I'm doing this process and I'm feeling like, wow, this is really, this is something I'm really tuning into uh, the earth and the elements and all of this. And I'm picking up on the sense that the sun is now going down into the ocean. And so what flashed on me at that moment was Osensei's talk or uh, practice of uh, fire and water. And whenever we did this in class at the dojo, honestly, I never really completely connected with fire and water. But in this instance, here I am in front of this magnificent occurrence, which is the sun setting into the water. And I'm picking up on the sense that this for me at that moment was a fire and water experience. And so I got into this realm that was uh, very different. I mean, it felt very profound and somewhat mystical. And so I'm in this experience and uh, I'm getting this connection to the earth and all of the elements and all of that. And I glance over to my left, and there's this guy walking his dog. And uh, he's looking up in the sky over there. And I looked up, and uh, I noticed this hawk up there. Uh, because it's a windy day, you know, the hawk just hovers. And it can just literally stay in one place, just navigating the wind. And so it was hovering up there over on the left. And then it would drop down a few feet, hover back up dropped down a few feet, and it was moving about, and it started moving toward me. And so I'm looking over at it, and I'm thinking, wow, this is you know, kind of a cool experience. And uh, I looked away for a moment, looked back, and the hawk was gone. And I'm like, wow, that's weird. It was here a second ago, and now the thing's gone. And so I'm going back into this process, and then it, it's starting to hit me. I'm starting to get this kinesthetic experience. This hawk is right above me. And so I couldn't see it in any direction. And the only direction I could see was if I turned my head literally straight up and there it was about 10 feet over my head, just hovering. And like, I'm in this experience, like, whoa, this is really something after having done this whole processing experience and being a part of nature or picking up on that, you know, here's this hawk over my head. And it got to a place where, you know, this energy was coming up and I do sense he might say, you know, kind of pushed me which it was, it was pushing me off my, off that establishment of a structure I had just built. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna step off to the side here. Maybe it's looking to take something out on the, on the ground or whatnot. So I stepped off to the side over here 
And within a moment, boom, it's right over my head again, just hovering. And I saw it because, again, I have to look straight up over the head, over my head. So I was like, okay, well, let's see. And I went over here again. So this, and sure enough, this hawk is coming right over my head. So this thing is like stalking me or so it seems, right? So this went on about four or five times. And, uh, you know, I'd spent, the sun had gone down. I had done the process. I got this experience to some level. And uh, I decided, okay, I'm going to, it was time for me to go. So I start walking away and the hawk then goes over toward this other lady and leaves eventually. Uh, and there was a guy over there. So I was talking to the guy. He says, oh, yeah. He says, you know, that was a red-tailed hawk. And uh, what it does is it, uh, it hovers over its prey and then it uh, scares them. And when it scares like a mouse or something, the mouse takes off and then it shoots down and grabs the mouse. Right? And when he said that, it hit me that, you know, that was kind of the experience I felt. It was a certain amount of feeling like, I got to get out of here. I got to run, right? And, uh, but I didn't. I stayed there, explored it, checked it out. So uh, later I left and I was trying to be with that whole experience, you know, what that was about. And I thought, well, I'll bring it up to uh, Nado Sensei. So one day after class, I brought it up to him. And uh, I said, well, you know, I don't know really what it means exactly, but I was getting this connection to the earth and blah, 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 blah. And I said, maybe it has something to do with work because I feel like I was under attack there for a little while at work. And, you know, he just dismissed that and said, no, you should take a look at this from a perspective of like a Native American story and uh, embody what that experience was. So over time, I've been embodying that or exploring that or inquiring about that and continue to do this process that would then allow me to open this up even more and get this kind of in my body. And what I recognized was it was about getting in my body this connection to the earth and this connection to the, to the fact that we live on a planet circling a star, uh, orbiting a star in a solar system, you know, blah, 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 blah. But it was getting to be a very real experience. So anyway, what I want to do now is I want to show you this process or the sequence that I was doing. And uh, I invite you to use this or to explore it as your own inquiry, if this feels right for you, to uh, get a sense of uh, that connection to the earth. Because I think that where we're at right now is a critical stage and that we need to kind of recalibrate ourselves with respect to our connection to the planet that we live on. All right, so here's the sequence. So we'll start off here. We're going to go first to the left, all right? Now, this is an expression using that same structure we had earlier, good base of support, good foundation underneath us, extension of energy, not over, not back, not, you know, collapse out, a good presentation off to the left, an expression of our self and energy coming through this system. And then we'll go to the right, okay? So we're going to go to the left, and we're going to go to the right. Again, we've got a center line, left, center line, right. And the center is always there. And the left and right allow us to kind of highlight and show that center a little more directly. Okay? So now the next move we're going to do in the sequence is left, right. And then we're going to go down, okay? Down. So we're kind of combining some of the elements that Nada Sensei does in a lot of his processing explorations with us. So here, left, right, down, down. I want to go down. Let that go down, down, down. Left, right, down, and then we're going to come up. Okay, so left, right, down, and we're going to come straight up, okay? We're going to allow this to come up. So when I say we're going to go up, I don't mean anything that we have to do about this. I mean that there's an up. So if there's a down, there's an up. If there's a left, there's a right. And in the middle of all that, there's a center, okay? So down, uh, left, sorry, right, 
down, up, and then we're gonna come down with a center. So we're gonna highlight that center that we've established all throughout the class from the very beginning. One, two, three, up, highlighting the center. Okay, one, two, three, up, and center. Okay, one more time. And then once we pick up this center, what's revealed from the center is a natural circle. So whenever you have a center, you have a circle. You have a surrounding, surrounding that circle. Okay, so left, right, down, up, center, and the center just naturally leads to a circling. All right, left, right, down, up, okay, so one more time here. Left, right, down, up, center, and it leads to a circle. Okay, and so the way I've done this is, I've done it at this pace. I've also done it one, two, three, four, five, six. So it just depends upon what, what that moment is for me and how that's generating. But what it does for me is it kind of activates my whole system. So it almost is like a compass. It allows me to pick up all of the directions, having myself or this center that's connecting to the deep earth, up to the stars, up to the cosmos, inside of this individual unit here. So it's a practice. It's not like every time I feel like I'm part of the you know, Milky Way galaxy, but the practice is such that I use it to connect myself to this reality that really too easily gets dismissed, which is that we're living on a planet. And this planet needs our care. It needs our support. We need to, as human beings, recognize our stewardship of this planet. And this is a process I use to kind of deepen this and activate that for me, at least. Okay? So we'll do one more here. One. And then so. Sometimes what I do here is I would then do a two-step. Okay, so what I do is I use that to kind of not only activate the static structure that I've just developed, but then send it into motion so that it's not just this experience that I have, but it's an actual moving body in space to pick up this other uh, realm and activate it in the world. Okay, so let's try it now. We'll add that two step, but don't jump into it. Take your time with each one, allow each step along the way to show itself completely and allow it to get inside your body and, uh, and kind of own it in that sense, all right? All right, one more. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to use this as a setup, as a recalibration process to calibrate myself to another dimension and then access that dimension so that I can live as that and function as that and think as that and be sensitized to that realm and then make choices and make uh, conversations, communications from that place as well. So once we arrive there, once we explore that and open that up, 
I'm suggesting and I'm inviting you to use this as an inquiry yourself because it's not, we're not, it's not like we're, we're there. Once we get it, we're there. I mean, this process and that experience happened to me a year and a half ago. And it was, you know, how does this get embodied? How does this get put into my practice, into my body? And at that time, we were still training, but the COVID came in. And by the time this whole thing started to materialize for me and I started recognizing what it was, we were kind of out of the system and uh, off in downtime. So, uh, so anyway, I pass this along to you. Use it for what you will. I hope it's uh, useful to you. And I hope you'll take it in consideration with the story that it uh, came from uh, and that connection to uh, the earth and our planet that we live on. Because I really think that uh, as Aikido, as Aikidoka, this really is a, a next stage for us. We can keep doing whatever we do on the mat. We can keep getting better and better. We can keep developing ourselves. And at some point, we've got to take a look around at the situation we find ourselves in and actually do what we have to do to impact that in a way that changes things for the good for all. And so uh, in that spirit, I truly wish uh, uh, I'd pass this along to you. Okay, let's bow out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roy Sensei. And we're gonna take a five minute break and at the end of everybody will gather the instructors back for a discussion, if that's okay. Thank you, so, Roy, for that heartfelt presentation. Really Very nice, nice, Roy. All right, we're gonna go on a five minute break, everybody. When you hear this bell again, it's time to come back.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's our pleasure to introduce, my pleasure to introduce Bob Noah Rokudan, uh, Chief Instructor and Founder of Aikido of Petaluma, uh, just north of San Francisco, and uh, uh, one of uh, Nado Sensei's longest uh, time, long time students and uh, the man about town. And so I'm going to disappear and let Bob continue. Thank you, Noah Lauren. Sensei, please. To tell my wife you said I was a man about town. I, uh, I'm not sure she'll believe you, but I'm going to try. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. I'd like to thank Nado Sensei and through him, O Sensei, and Lauren, Kenny, and Richard for the wonderful technical support. Also, both the previous instructors today and in classes before this and the ones to come uh, next week uh, for not only excellent classes, but producing just a wonderful community spirit. I think I mentioned this last week, but as great as the classes are, this community spirit is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And thank everybody for coming. So what we're going to work on today, I think it will blend well with the uh, two classes before, is kind of a step-by-step -step practice of circle and center. Circle and center is a practice that the Do Sensei has talked a lot about. Uh, Roy just shared a wonderful and uh, truly heartfelt practice with us just a moment before. And so we're going to use the technique of Tenshinage, the heaven and earth throw, is kind of our reference point. And what I mean by that is we'll start and go through Tenshinage a couple times on each side together, kind of using it as a, a solo kata, since uh, most of us don't have a partner to train with. And that will help us to kind of establish a baseline of experience. And then we'll go through a basic circle and center practice and pause at each point in the practice to go back to Tenshinage and see how the practice we just did with circle or center or bringing them both together had a, an effect on our experience with Tenshinage. So Tenshinage will be kind of our uh, reference point as we go through the practice to help us more deeply experience what's going on. So I wanted to share just a quote from O Sensei about circle and center. And here it is. This is from the book, uh, The Secret Teachings of Aikido, uh, which is a series of lectures that O Sensei gave at Hombu Dojo in the 1950s. And he says here, Aikido techniques consist of circular blending movements Feel the technical movements throughout your body and keep your spirit circular. A circle is completely empty. The emptiness from which all things emerge. Completely empty means perfectly free. From the center of that complete emptiness, the universe emerged. This is ikumutsubi or generating creative force, the parent of all things. To understand Aikido, first draw a circle. When a circle is made, it creates a sphere of influence. If you bring your opponent within the sphere of influence, you can then throw him with just the touch of a finger. However, it takes a minimum of 10 years of serious training to accomplish a feat like this. I think Osensei might have been being kind to us about the 10 years, but it does take a long time. And then a little further, he says, control the spirit within a circle and create living techniques. Birth is unlimited. The abundance and fulfillment of life is manifest in a circle. A circle is ki mutsubi, or bringing ki together, and iku mutsubi, or initiating energies. In this world, all karmic relationships form a circle. The boo of aiki is also a circle. Blend matter and spirit that creates a spiritual center. So I'd like to also show just a brief video of O Sensei doing a circle center practice. And then a video of uh, Saito Sensei and Doshu doing a Tenshinage in case some of you aren't familiar with the technique. So here's O Sensei 
This is from a video that some of you may have seen uh, later on in it. It has Terry Dobson in it. One of the things I remember the Sensei saying many times, the Sensei would do something like this before class to kind of tune himself up in effect until he felt ready. And you might notice he's actually doing it with a spear rather than a Joe, which is a representation from the Kojiki of how the god and goddess Izanami and Izanage created Japan. Then here's Saito Sensei doing a, a Kihon Waza, a basic version of Tenshinage. And here's Doshu doing a more flowing version from a class at the uh, Hombu Dojo. Here's the order version. We're just going to do the entering version today. So there it is. Oops, change the camera here so you can see me when I stand up. There we go. I'd also appreciate it if uh, you could share your experiences as we're going along, unmute yourself. I think it'll make the class more uh, interesting and beneficial for everyone if we can do a little bit of sharing of experience. So first here, just starting with the left foot forward here, left hand is earth, right hand is heaven and stepping through for very basic Tenshinage. Nothing fancy. What we're trying to do here is establish a baseline that we can then use for comparison as we go along. Left hand is earth, right hand is heaven, and stepping through. And then switching feet, right foot forward, right hand will now be earth, left hand is heaven, and stepping through one more time. Right hand down, left hand up, and stepping through. So just again, to kind of establish a baseline here, what I felt as I went through that, what kind of just naturally attracted my attention this time was how the kind of the two hands, sort of the palms sort of interacted with each other. So that's sort of my baseline experience. Uh, could somebody share yours, please? Uh, hey, this is Lauren, and, and for, me, it's, for, for me, it's for me, it's the circle coming together. Okay. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Somebody else want to share? Go ahead, please. This is hey, Sensei. <laughs> for me, Sensei, um, it was establishing Earth first being established in earth first and then coming to okay okay great thank you and Sassoon, did you want to share also i might be influenced by the previous classes but the continuity of the one point or the hara throughout the expanding technique carried through very nice thank you okay well let's move on so from here Let's now work with a circle to start with, just as O Sensei said in the quote I read. And here, not just kind of a generic circle, but let's ask for a circle specific to Tenshinage. Ah, so as we kind of relax and settle and allow this circle to open and spread, 
attention to the experience of the circle and how the circle that you're feeling right now relates specifically to Henshinage. Ah. What I can feel here is it, it kind of has this sort of attribute to it, that one side's going to sort of tilt toward the earth and the other toward the heavens. If we were going to do a circle of Shomenuchi Ikkyo, it probably would feel a little bit different. So could somebody share what your experience of your Tenshi Nage circle is? I would spit out for me, Bob. This is Roy. Is the uh, thing you said earlier, which was the connection of the hands and the kind of the uh, synchronous movement of the hands as they came out. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Roy. Maybe somebody and, else share, please. I, yeah. You know, I got kind of that the that the the tenshinagi is going to nurture the circle, like it's got a nurturing relationship. Ah. So it's kind of feeding back in a sense. Yeah, but in a very kind way. Yes, you know? yes. Ah, thank you, Ross. Maybe somebody mm -hmm. else share. What's your experience here of the circle of Tenshinage? This is Patrick. For me, it feels like it's opening up the space. Ah. In no sense, they said the, the circle represents a place of freedom. So that sounds nice. Anybody else want to share before we move along? Hi, Bob Sensei. This is uh, Lou. I, um, I asked for the circle to appear for, uh, for this particular move. Uh, circle came in immediately. And within the circle, though, I felt a very strong pyramidal structure, actually reddish. That was... Uh, as soon as I just moved a bit, it was rotating with me. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Leave it to the artist to bring in a beautiful color also, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> Thank you, Sensei. Ah. Okay, yes, so with the... go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, yeah, please. Danny here. Yes, uh, I, I like the invitation to the circle of the particular technique. And as soon as I did it, I felt it wrap around me completely and very, very much touching my spine. What did it feel like when it touched your spine, Danny? It felt like invigoration and a newness in my spine. It started to rise from the center of my spine up and down. Wow. And if there was a color, it would be a very light blue. That's an experience a lot that you might hear from somebody doing a qigong practice or a kundalini yoga practice. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out in the technique. Anybody else want to share before we move on? Hi, this is Cliff Winnick. Yes. Uh, we don't know each other, but hi. Um, hi. The be what struck me if, after a few times was the beginning, not the circle itself, but the point of separating the hands to get to the circle yes. felt kind of like a flower opening, like the petals opening, and it kind of knew where it was going on its own. Wow, terrific. In that book that I read the passage from, O Sensei talks a lot about a plum blossom, which is an image from Omotokyo, the spiritual group he was in. And he talks in many, many places in there, he says it's the flowering in 3,000 worlds, he says, of the, the plum blossom. All right, so let's take this experience of the Tenshinage circle and go back to the Tenshinage technique and see how it changes the experience from our first go around. So starting with the left foot forward, sliding in, left hand to the earth, right hand to the heavens, and stepping in. Once again, left foot forward, sliding in, left hand to the earth, right to the heavens, and stepping through to complete the throw, and then switching to the right foot forward, same thing here, 
right foot, right hand to the earth, left hand to the heavens, and stepping through one more time. Down and up and stepping through. What I noticed was a couple of things. One is the technique almost seemed to be breathing as I went through it, especially the last couple. And even before that, I had a much better sense of connection between the heaven and the earth sides just through my arms and hands than I did the first time. So could somebody share your experience, please? How did it change from the baseline uh, when we went through it the first time? This is Sassoon. Yes, Sassoon. I had a supportive energy come through, so I was expecting it to be more supportive. And yet, when I did the technique, it was supportive, but much more powerful as well. I was uh, drawing my uke through in a much imaginary uke through in a much greater way. Oh, thank you. Somebody else share what was different the second time around with the circle of Tenshinage? Anybody Hi. else? Go ahead, please. Oh. Hi, you don't you don't know me. My name is Yaro. Um, but it was kind of it doesn't sound as poetic as other people's, but I felt like the circle is uh, spewing out my guts. <laughs> <laughs> when I go forward, my guts kind of just fall out, uh, shoot out of my stomach. That's what it feels like. It may not seem poetic, but it certainly sounds experiential, and that's what we're going for. <laughs> so very nice. Somebody else share, please. Uh, this is Lauren. I get more of a sense of verticality mm. of of uh, the hands in particular separating much more verticality. Thank you, Laura. One more person, if somebody else would like to share. Share, this is, this is Amy. Um, I get a sense of enveloping that there's, I'm, I'm embracing the attacker in some ways. Yes, yes. Very nice, Amy, thank you. Anybody else want to share before we move on to center. Okay, well, let's move on then. So just as you saw in the uh, video of O Sensei, here we kind of visualize we're holding a Joe in our hands just like he was in the video. If you have a Joe and you want to hold it, that's fine too. But here, center, spiraling up, and spiraling down, spiraling down. And spiraling up. And just as we were with the circle of Tenshinage, here this is not just a generic center, but center of Tenshinage, heaven and earth. Spiraling up and spiraling down. Spiraling down and spiraling up. And that feeling I had that, that uh, one, one person shared about how it kind of energized the spine, I kind of have that feeling here as well. Spiraling up the spine, spiraling down the front of the body. Ah, and a nice settling here. So could somebody share your experience, please, of the center of Tenshinage? Uh, this is Eugene. Uh, eh, hello. Uh, it looks like that there is some sort of arriving. The center, uh, the center going up some, somehow, arriving to the heavens, and the yes. center going up, uh, down, kind of arriving to the earth. So there is a moment of arriving in both in both movements, which usually doesn't exist for me when I practice the center. All right. Very nice. Yeah, that sense of simultaneous connection is, is certainly a wonderful experience, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the technique. Somebody else, please share your experience of center of Tenshinage.
Uh, I'll share. Uh, so uh, what Eugene said uh, there, um, I get um, two spirals up, down, very fluid through the hands, almost like a, if I were to, 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 to describe it, almost like a DNA spiral it looks like. Oh, nice. It feels like. Very good. Okay, well, let's move on. So let's go back to Tenchinage, the technique. Once again, with the left foot forward here. Ah, and so we're adding to our experience of the Tenchinage circle, our experience of the Tenchinage center. So sliding forward, left hand to the earth, right to the heavens, and stepping through with the right foot. One more time here. Sliding in, left hand to the earth, right hand to the heavens, and stepping through. Now switching to the right foot forward, right foot and hand to the earth, left to the heavens, and stepping through. One more time. Right foot, right to the earth, left to the heavens, and stepping through. The thing I got by having center join circle, I had a much more vivid experience that I actually had an uke to practice with. And then my uke also had a center that I could kind of connect with. I didn't get that so much with a circle, but I really got that sense of a real uke to practice with from the center. So could somebody share your experience? How did the center change your experience of the Tenshinage technique? It, it grounded it for me. Okay, yeah. So it, because the center was moving through the circle, it, I mean, it was probably there before, I just wasn't thinking about it, but, but it keeps it grounded and keeps it properly situated. Very nice. Yeah, I like that, especially that last phrase. It keeps it properly situated. Yeah, that's a lawyer, you know. Who's that say? <laughs> Very nice, Ross. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Somebody else, please share. Can she not? Yeah, for me, her? Bob. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. For me, Bob, uh, it was uh, somewhat similar to what your experience was in the sense that it really uh, recognized that it was in relationship. So mm. the center was in relationship with another or another center uh, and the situation. So it had a kind of a connection that was different. And in those sense, they often says centers love centers, right? Other centers. So if we have a strong center, even if our partner isn't feeling a strong center themselves, we can connect with it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Roy. Uh, anybody else like to share before we move on? This is Patrick. For me, what emerged was a sense of a downbeat at the beginning of the technique and then an upbeat as I did the technique. It's kind of a pulse that, e that emerged. Kind of reminds me of the thing I think I said before. I felt like it was breathing kind of. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Anybody else like to share before we move on? Okay, so from here, now let's bring center and circle together. Now the circle of Tenshinage, opening, spreading, and settling. You might even notice because we practiced with the center, the circle got a little better too. Ah, and the center of Tenshinage spiraling up and spiraling down. Spiraling down and spiraling up. So we have center and circle here together. And one of the points Nado Sensei makes very often that is really worth remembering very often, and that is these two parts of the system, now that they're in balance, can help us to mix up a, what he calls a character or the one who does Tenchinage in this case. Ah, so. Center, reaching out the circle. Circle responding back to center. 
that interaction can take many, many forms, just depending on how your system works. Could feel like electricity, like water, like sound. Had one student who was a mechanical engineer, he said it was gears interlocking. So however your system feels the interaction between circle and center, center and circle, to mix up you, the embodiment of Kenshinage. The thing I notice here from just that little moment of interaction is I didn't even know I was doing this before, but I was thinking about the steps involved in doing Tenshinage, the footwork, the hands, all of that. Here I sort of don't think about it as much. It's kind of more of a whole experience. Ah, and especially I notice my back starting to relax and open. Given the fact most of the physical action is out here, it's easy to lose that. But sort of a more experiential Tenshinage rather than one where I'm kind of parsing my way through it one move at a time. So could somebody share your experience, please, as the embodiment of Tenshinage? It emanates from a sense of mystery. Mm. It just seems to mysteriously appear. Okay. Be interesting to see how the mystery plays out, right? <laughs> Somebody else, please share. I would say that I had this, this has more flexibility to it than the others did. That this, it's a more of an adaptable. Uh, Kind so of if a, your uke responds in a way you don't expect, you'll be okay. That's something like that, yeah. yeah. It's, ah, thank you. Uh, Lauren, did you want to share yours? No. Oh, okay. I saw you on the screen there. That's why I asked. I, I, I bumped my chair. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to share? before we go back to the technique. This, this is Patrick. I have a sense of the center becoming the circle mm. and the circle becoming the center. And they're kind of, again, being a rhythm going on there between the two. Oh, Sensei loved that kind of sense of mirroring. That story he loved in the Kojiki where they drew the sun goddess out of the cave and restored light and uh, warmth to the world by putting a mirror in front of the cave and she saw her true herself in the mirror and came out so yeah okay i think we're just about done so let's go around one more time on tenshinage to finish up left foot forward coming through here and stepping through right foot forward sliding in and stepping through. I just kind of noticed I included my uke a lot better without going into detail. That, that was my experience. So could somebody share yours as we finish up, please? Yes, Sensei Bob. Um, I, I feel from this uh, experience of fluid spine, I feel like I've got a lot of reserve I feel backed up, so uh, yeah, I can take it easy. I don't, I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. I've got all the reserves that I need. Yes, that's yeah. a good feeling. Yes, it is. Anybody else want to share? I think we're just about at the end of our time. Uh, you have uh, this. Uh, this is Lauren. You have another seven minutes. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. But. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I will say that uh, on my self, this last uh, round, I was aware of how both the both hands are extending, even though or as they're extending and they're separating and coming together. In other words, there it is all extension. There's not a retreat part, you know, or it, it, that 
even though we're extending, but we're making that circle. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Well, since we got a couple more minutes, let's just go around on it again. Circle of Tenshinage, kind of round two. The Do Sensei was talking about this a little bit last night in his class that, yeah, it, it's good to repeat a process a few times, kind of like Roy shared with us here. And here we can kind of use a principle that O Sensei talked about called the mountain echo, the Yama Biko. Ask ourselves, what is level two? Ah, circle of Tenshinage. And then just staying present, alert, receptive, and let the kind of returning echo do the rest of the work. And then with center, same thing here. Level two center of Tenshinage. Spiraling up, spiraling down. What is the level two center? And allowing a moment for that sense of the returning echo to fill your system with the experience. Center level two reaches out to circle level two. Circle level two responding back to center level two. So here we are as kind of the embodiment of Tenshinage level two. So let's go back to the technique again and see how we do as level two embodiment of Tenshinage. Sliding in and stepping through. One more time. Sliding in and stepping through. And then right foot forward, same thing. Sliding in, stepping through. Sliding in and stepping through. The thing I noticed was because there was more energetic fullness there, first one or two, I kind of got bumped a little bit along the lines of what Nado Sensei was talking about in class last night that ask for a little more. And first, you get kind of bumped sometimes by the extra energy, which you have asked for. So remembering that, rather than kind of retreating back to level one, I kind of hung in there, and the last few felt pretty good. Ah, so anybody want to share your experience at level two? This time, I think we are getting close to being out of time. Level two experience, anybody like to share it? I'm saying, uh, um, the spiraling for me uh, felt like the grounding energy, the spiraling up and down and related to the stepping in. And the circle energy is for me, a receiving a receptive type of energy. As I'm stepping through, I feel I'm receiving okay. As I'm stepping through, I'm not just being positive, just throwing. I feel like I'm receiving that energy from Uke as well. When you went to level two, there was a receiving element to it, not just a throwing element to it? Yes. Okay. Very definitely nice. receiving, even with an imaginary uke, very receptive. I suspect uh, even the imaginary uke, but certainly a real uke, would find that a more pleasant experience to, uh, to take that fall. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, are we got to be out of time just about now, right? Just about now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. And, thank you, Bob. Uh, Great to see you. Thank you. And I think that we have uh, 15 minutes for Q&A and discussion with the instructors. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask people if uh, the three instructors can light up their cameras. Um, we'll see if we can uh, bring you guys on to Spotlight. All right, and uh, we see all three of our fine uh, instructors for the day. Thank you all very much on behalf of everybody. We've had uh, 44 people on the 
in the session. Uh, and uh, on behalf of everybody, I want to thank all three of you for such wonderful uh, glimpses into your Aikido. Uh, I'd like to open the floor up to discussion. Anybody want to say something, just shout out and uh, throw it out to everybody, all to three instructors, or specifically ask uh, somebody by name. Hi, Ross. Um, it's Tom here. Hey, Tom. Hey, I was driving around in my truck, coming up to here at my house, pulled, pulled over and pulled you up on my phone to watch the series and the instruction that you gave. Um, is there a way, is there a YouTube or a video or some resource that uh, I can Google to see the sequences that you demonstrated? You know, I don't know, but what I could do, um, since we share so many deep spir spiritual experiences, uh, going back to the March on Washington in 1960, whenever it was. With Alan uh, Ginsberg. <laughs> Don't yeah, forget yeah. Alan Ginsberg. <laughs> Alan Ginsberg, yeah. yeah. But I'll just share with everybody. Tom and I both were at the same March on Washington, and it was completely crazy. Everybody was whacked out of their minds. They were throwing bottles and bombs and you name it. And in the middle of it, I hear this incredibly beautiful, deep, chanting voice uh, with a little, uh, the sound of a Tibetan accordion. I don't know what they're called. And it was, he, Allen Ginsberg had a beautiful voice. Well, Tom was there at the same time. Of course, we didn't know each other, but it's a very special bond that we both heard him because it was really one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my life. And it was in such an incongruous situation. So for you, <laughs> I'll make copies of, I'll, I'll Xerox the pages and send them out. We, we actually have a recording of this class, which will be made available. So uh, you will be able to see uh, that later, Tom. There's also a YouTube video of Tohei Sensei doing these exercises. On, on the rooftop of a Japanese newspaper uh, company. So if you search, I've seen them on YouTube as well, just as Ross has presented them. Oh, that's good, because I was afraid I did them wrong. <laughs> no, no, Ross quite. did a wonderful job. And Very nice. Funny, Tohei sent a story about one point. This was in the early days of my training in the Mountain View Dojo on Castro Street. And there was one guy in the dojo, there's probably one in every dojo, that nobody really liked very much. And Tohei Sensei had just done an interview in Black Belt Magazine. So we were talking about this interview. And the interviewer asked him about keeping one point. And he said, do you do what most people do, which is keep one point just in the dojo, or do you do it outside the dojo? And Toei Sensei said, no, I always keep one point. So we were talking about this, and this guy said, you think he really does keep one point all the time? And, and being young and stupid uh, and not liking this guy, Toei Sensei happened to be in the dojo, our dojo at that moment. He was in a restroom. We said, why don't you try him out and see? So he walked across behind kind of where the desk was in the front office to where the bathroom door was. And as Toei Sensei came out of the bathroom, he jumped him. And the next thing we knew, this guy flew all the way across the whole length of the dojo and right into the wall. And as he's laying on the floor, we leaned over and said, yeah, I think he does keep one point all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Doe Sensei gave us a real tongue lashing for being idiots. Not for the last time either. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah I just I just saw a video of Tohei. It was some demonstration he did maybe in Southern California or something when he first came here. It was it was nice, you know, really nice. It was sort of a group attack and he just it was really nice to watch. Where yeah. did you see that, Russ? I'm trying to remember, I was very surprised. I think I somehow I went on my phone. I was, I think I was looking up um, uh, Saito Sensei stuff, and all of a sudden it clicked over to this thing. If I find it again, I'll send it to you. The reason I asked is Tohei Sensei, when he first came to California, it was 1953, 
and he gave a demonstration at the first U.S. Judo Championships, which were at San Jose State. And unbeknownst to him, because he didn't speak English at that point, the announcer invited any five judo black belts to come out for a no-holds-barred attack on him. And all of a sudden, these guys are rumbling out on the mat. And I know several people who were at that event, and they said they were out to hurt him, not just to humiliate him. And he just completely dominated these five guys, one of whom was Gene LaBelle, who was the heavyweight champion that year and one of the toughest guys you'll ever meet. Yeah, and he's the, always, choker, the choker, what? right? He's what? the ch choking guy. That's the guy, right. The guy who choked Steven Seagal out on the movie set. Right. But yeah, he, Toei Sensei completely dominated these five guys. Uh, it's yeah, gotta, I, don't know, wanna... I don't know if that's what I saw the film from. Yeah. Well, there was a film of it, but I've never been able to track it down. So sorry to monopolize the time, but I, I was hoping somebody had found it. Uh, and uh, does anybody else have a question they'd like to have our illustrious instructors address? I have a question for Roy. And who is this, please? This is Linda. Linda Morris. Um, when you were, I love that story you told us about being on the beach. And when you were there and you said, uh, well, you mentioned that um, the, the birds, the uh, hawks uh, go above their prey. Did you feel like you were being preyed upon or did, because what I thought of was you were creating a vortex that this, this flying creature was noticing. That's what I was thinking. But you, then you mentioned the prey. What did you feel like when that happened? You know, it was, uh, it was just a kinesthetic uh, experience that, you know, that was unfamiliar to me. I mean, it was, uh, I didn't really know what to make of it when it was occurring. And uh, so I, I tried being with it for a while and, uh, and yet it was just so kind of rattling in a way. Um, you know, at some point I thought, I got to get out of here. But uh, that wasn't really where I stayed most of the time. It was just, I did have that experience. It's wanting to run to a certain extent or being pushed as a Nado sensei might say. Uh, but I really stayed with it and just allowed this uh, experience. So uh, I'm not sure, but it was a kinesthetic. I mean, I felt, you know, because I, mean, I didn't even know where it was. And then it was over my head and, you know, you couldn't see it. Yeah. Great story. Thank you. Yeah. It's Mike. I'd just, just like to say thank you to the three of you for some wonderful, wonderful time together. Yeah. Great presentations. It's nice to get together like this, you know? <laughs> like what you, yeah. said about, what you said about community is true, because it's easy to lose that, you know? So we should thank the Zoom gods for coming up with this whole hoop to do of <laughs> Zoom meetings. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I really appreciated um, all three of you. And even though I, um, all three of your classes and presentations, I, although I doubt you talked to each other about what you were going to do, they really flowed really impeccably. Um, you know, they just went one, two, three, boom. So, um, and I could describe other stuff, but I just want to say it really flowed impeccably. So thank all of you very much. We did not talk to each other beforehand. I didn't think you had, but I'm just saying it flowed, baby. Yeah, well, this is probably because we're all kind of from the same tradition, you know? Yeah, I was thinking like, okay, I'm gonna do something like, I hope this works. Who knows what these guys are gonna do, you know? <laughs> I have to say, I have to say, this is Lauren. I have to say that you know, with uh, you know, Ross, you know, this this sequence from Tohei Sensei is so nostalgic. The and you know, for Bob Noah to take us through Tenchi Nage, you know, I haven't done a Tenchi Nage in a year, right? <laughs> and uh, it's always been you know one of my favorites and uh so so fundamental so it's been really wonderful to like touch these you know oh i remember that yeah that's why i got into aikido in the first place 
you know, that's been wonderful today. Thank you. How do you spell Toy Sensei's name? Rough. Say again. Um, what is the spelling of Toihei's? I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Toihei Sensei's name. How do you? Yes, his 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 given name is Koichi, K O I C H I, and his family name is Tohei, T O H E I. Koichi Tohei. And and that's okay. in the chat too, Tom. Um, and, and it's also in the Ross chat. Ross is Tom. showing it to you on, oh. the, on the video. Thank you, Ross. Hey, oh, thank you. Video. I, I had a little. I had a question, uh, uh, and actually, it came up in your practice mostly, Noah. But I, I've noticed, and, and it's a little new, um, that, uh, for example, I went on a long hike today, and and my body was fine. And then I we came in, started doing these simple practices, really, and I, I noticed uh, part of my foot was hurting. So I'm I'm, I'm feeling these kind of odd pains coming up when I, you know, settle into my body. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I'd love to hear from the three of you, uh, you know, if this, if this is at all familiar to you and, and do you take these as any different than any other, uh, you know, uh, being uncomfortable energetically on, on, you know, feeling out of sorts, do the physical body pains, do you process those uh, any differently? You know, I get, I get those too. And then I always, I always wonder, like, how can I possibly be getting fatigued that I didn't do anything? You know, I mean, I would, you know, if I open my arms and step forward. Right? And I just figure we're not, we're not perfect vessels. And, you know, we're working towards it, you know, and, and the more you do them, the less it feels awkward. And the more your body is in tune with sort of the energy flow, then the better you feel. But I get those too. You're not the only one, you know. And and I always think to myself, God, that's really strange. You know, you think because like I'm, if I, <laughs> you know what I mean, like I know what you mean, like yeah. you hike ten miles, you feel fine. You do like six things. <laughs> you, feel like an idiot, you know, yeah, yeah. There's, eight, eight, there's a little age involved too, Kenny. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Roy, I felt with your. Uh, uh, the, the tremendous amount of energy uh, was generated, even doing it slow um, and moving slowly through it. It's not so much the musculoskeletal effort, it's the energy that's generated. And I know listening to Nato Sensei many times, it's sort of getting grounded and preparing yourself for the energy that wants to come through with a certain movement, um, sometimes it can push you. But I felt your kata was really energizing. I could see starting the day that way and, and moving forward. Um, it, it was really great. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it really is, was an activation for me. I mean, it activates my whole system. And uh, clearly it activated another realm and uh, I recognize it as doing that. And so I use it for that. And the focus that I've used it for really is this connection to the earth and uh, seeing if we can uh, put human beings actually on this planet instead of uh, acting as if, uh, you know, we're, this is just a, a resource for us for human use. So, yeah, right. great, Thank that's great. Thank you. And we have time for one last round of interactions if anybody would like to bring up anything else looking forward to next week yeah you know the one thing i just did want to bring up which i didn't mention in the class was that you know when i look around on their class on uh friday nights and see the people that are on that call and uh, like ross had brought up you know how long people have been training and uh, being participating in aikido I started adding up the numbers and it, it really hit me that on any given Friday night with Nado Sensei or these classes, you know, we have probably 500 plus years, I'm talking years of experience on these calls. So we're people that have devoted that many years to this as an exploration and as a development. 
And it really is a remarkable community, as Bob Noah has clearly shared, uh, that we've brought together and uh, the impact that uh, that can have. So thank you. The 500 years explains why the muscles hurt, too. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> That's the New Yorker talking. <laughs> Yeah, no, for the four, first 410, didn't hurt at all. That's the battery. My old chief master sergeant in the Air Force always used to tell us when we'd complain, he said, shut up, uh, pain just tells you you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, <laughs> I want to thank our three instructors uh, today, uh, Ross Madden, Roy Johnston, Bob Noah. And I want to thank uh, all the participants uh, who put in the time and the energy to join this community. Uh, it's a virtual dojo, but it's still, you know, functioning. As long as we keep practicing, the dojo's alive. Uh, next week uh, will be the fourth uh, Saturday uh, uh, for the O oh, Sensei Revisited 2021. Teachers will be Ken Cron, Susan Spence, and Richard Moon. And like they say, don't miss it. The best is yet to come. <laughs> Thank you all very much and Thank you, uh, have a good day. Bye-bye. Right. Thank, Thank you, Sensei Bob. Thank sensei. you, Noah Sensei. Sensei Ross. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. What a wonderful community. Uh, you, yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Bye -bye. Yes. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for coming in, Mike. All right. Sorry, Ken. Kenny, did you say something to me then? I wasn't. Oh, I just said, you know, thanks. Thanks for tuning in from halfway across the world there, you and Oh, well, hey, no, Mark th thank you for yeah. sending me the invitation because I'd forgotten to register. So I really appreciate that, <laughs> Kenny. Thank you. <laughs> anytime. anytime. Uh, just, uh, Mike, I want to tell you a secret. It's the same link every week. <laughs> <laughs> so right. even though you said we had to register for each you one. You do have actually. to register, and it's the same link every week. <laughs> uh, so, Kenny... Uh, you're going to control the recording uh, termination? Uh, I think it's best if you do it. Yeah, I should stop recording at least now. <laughs>